True Crime Dropouts may contain some graphic and explicit content that may not be suitable for some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everybody. You're listening to True Crime Dropouts. I'm Vanessa. And I'm Mary. And today we're going to be talking about a local case, actually. Um... I don't know if you've heard about it, Mayor. We're talking about Alexandria Joy Lowitzer. I think I have. I think I was in middle school when she went missing. Yeah, I I want to say we were probably like eighth graders when this happened. Um, So I really wanted to do this case first and foremost, not only because, I mean, it's local, but... Uh, it's actually, we are a couple of days away from her 10 year anniversary of being missing. Um, so I guess That's ridiculous. I know without further ado, let's go ahead and start. Awesome. So, <laughs> so daughter to Joanne and John Lowitzer, the younger sister of Mason, uh, Allie, Joy Lowitzer, who they, who they called her Allie, uh, was described by her parents and friends as fun, loving, energetic, creative, you know, just like any other teenager. Um, she loved to draw, and she was actually part of the softball team, and she was actually part of choir, and I think that's how I got to know her. A lot of the older girls that I knew um, were friends with her uh, in choir, so that's pretty interesting. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, She was also a Girl Scout, and she loved fishing with her dad. And, you know, according to her mom, she was a a homebody, and she enjoyed being home. And, you know, most of the time, her friends came and hung out at her house. So um, it was more of the norm for her to not really be an outside kind of person. Yeah, typical teenager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And (laughs) she was 16 uh, at the time. So, you know, of course, same thing. Very typical for um, a teenager at that time. So uh, how it starts, it was a typical Monday morning, April 26, 2010. Uh, Joanne wakes up her daughter for school just like any other day. And, you know, Ellie gets uh, dressed and she goes to school as normal. And, you know, the day goes by. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, around 2.30, right before school um, gets out when she's getting on the bus, she calls her mom and pretty much tells her, that she wants to head over to the Burger Barn. And this is a restaurant that she had just recently started working at at the time and asks her mom if she can go and pick up her check. Um, and of course, you know, I, the place was not very far from where she lived. Um, as far as I'm aware, if I can remember, uh, the Burger Barn was maybe uh, two or three miles from her house. So it was yeah, not too uh, far. The Burger Barn was pretty close to my house as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you lived uh, along Mm Treshwig. So, yeah. So, um, you know, her mom, knowing that Allie is not the kind of person to just walk around outside like normal like that, she hesitates and she tells her, no, you know, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, You know, no one's going to be able to take you. I don't think it's okay for you to do that. Uh, Obviously... Allie, like any other teenager, is insisting and insisting, like, come on, please, mom, like, let me go. I'm old Uh, enough. (laughs) Yeah, like, I can take care of myself. I know right from wrong kind of situation. Mm -hmm. And her mom obviously gives in and tells her, okay, that's fine. Go ahead and go. Um, Just give me a call when you come back home. Allie had also told her that if she was going to go pick up her check, she wanted to see if she can pick up a shift Um, at the burger barn so her mom also told her you know if you're gonna stay give me a call let me know that you're gonna be there Mm -hmm. um so you know the rest of the day goes by and joanne comes home at about 5 30 um she comes home she calls out for Allie, and she sees that no one's home um Allie's older brother wasn't home either he had already graduated high school but he had left earlier in the day Um, So, you know, she calls out for Allie and she sees that no one's there. So she goes ahead and tries to text her and call her um, to try to figure out, you know, if she had actually stayed for her shift. Mm -hmm. Um, Like any other mom, I assume you're going to be upset that they don't let you know that, hey, mom, I was going to stay for work. Um, So she goes ahead and assumes that Allie stayed um, for her shift. 
at around nine o'clock, which is when normally she would go pick up Allie, she drives to the burger barn and to any mom's horror, she finds that the restaurant is completely closed. It's dark. It's locked up. The tape, the, you know, the chairs are on top of the tables. I'd be losing my mind. Yeah, 100%. You know, you show up thinking that you're going to pick up your daughter and no one's there. I'd be pissed. I'd be like, where? Where are you? Yes. Where are you? 100%. And I think um, I got a lot of my information from the disappeared episode that they did on her. Um, and so in the episode itself, her mom says that, you know, she's like frantically looking into the window and, um, you know, just kind of pacing back and forth. Like, where is she? Where is my daughter? Her, you know, there's no cars in the parking lot. So she goes home and she assumes, well, maybe someone came and picked her up. Does Allie have a cell phone? Yes. So Allie does have a cell phone. Um, you know, so that's how she called her mom previously. She was going to let her mom know that she was going to be going to the burger barn. Um, Oh, Okay. Yeah, so she pretty much, you know, goes home, figures, well, maybe somebody came and picked her up and gave her a ride home or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, She goes home and nothing. Mm -hmm. Allie's not there. There's no sign of her. And note that it's been about six hours since she last spoke to Allie on the phone. Yeah. So obviously you're going to be freaking out as a parent. You're going to be like, what the hell? Where are you? Why aren't you answering? Um, So I think at this point she calls her um, son, Mason, trying to figure out, hey, have you, you know, heard of Allie? She calls her husband, John. And at this point, John and Joanne are no longer together. They're divorced, but they do have a very amicable relationship. They do um, still see each other for the kids. And, you know, as far as I can see, it's a very normal uh, family unit, even though the parents aren't together. It's still healthy. Yeah. So, um, you know, John tells her, no, I haven't seen her. She could have been out with her friends and maybe forgot to tell you, um, you know, so on and so forth. About 11 o'clock, she decides to call police. Um, And I this this I think this is the part of the whole case that really frustrates me. Um, She calls police and a constable from the local department shows up at her house. I want to say it's like precinct four. Mm -hmm. Um, calls, you know, comes to her house and speaks to her, literally is coming up to her house and just like a notebook in her hand Mm -hmm. and um, just kind of tells her, oh, well, you know, she'll be back soon. You know, if if she doesn't come back in the morning, just give us a call. Ten years later. Yeah, and (laughs) that part literally frustrates me so much because I had been doing so much digging on missing persons laws uh, for this case, and nowhere does it say um, that you need to wait 24 hours for a missing person, especially someone under the age of 18. Allie yeah. was 16 at the time. And but they even, automatically think, run away, she ran away, she's with her boyfriend, she's with a friend. Like, don't worry. Like, it's my child. What do you mean? Exactly. You I need know to know where kid. she is now. Yeah, and you know your kid better than anybody else. And even, it's so crazy, even on the Harris County Sheriff's Office uh, website, it says that there is no 24-hour waiting period required to report a missing person. And the constable that took, you know, Joanne's information didn't even want to open a missing person's case. And Mm -hmm. that is just so, it's so frustrating for me. Um, You know, they're younger, uh, she's younger than 18. She's not an adult at this point. It's not like she can just you know, do whatever she wants. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that happens. So depending on kind of like what you read, um, in some articles, it says that she waited until 5 a.m. And in some articles, they say that she waited until about 8 a.m. She says pretty much that she waits until that point to try and call police again. Um, And they still don't want to do anything about it. They're just kind of like, oh, she's a runaway. We'll just put her down as a runaway. We'll open a runaway case, but not a missing person's case. So again, Mm -hmm. still frustrating. Anybody under the age of 18, you know, you're a child. And what's the most important thing you learn in criminal justice? The first 24 hours are the most important. Crucial. Yeah, they're crucial. Anything could happen in those 24 hours. Yeah. So, um, you know, that happens. Uh, In the coming days, uh, they were able to kind of 
start picking a couple of, they do their own in- investigations pretty much. And they, um, try to see what information they can get to prove that Allie did not just get up and the, go. the mom and dad. Yeah. The mom and dad decide to kind of do their own investigation at, after the whole situation with the police, they want okay. to try to compile as much information as they can to give police to tell them my daughter to get a case. Away. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, in the disappeared episode, Joanne states that she had remembered that the AT&T plan that they had uh, has kind of what they called, I think it was like a AT&T family tracking program or family map, something like mm-hmm. that. And she was able to kind of pinpoint the last time Allie's phone was either turned on or the last time she sent a text. Um, and it happened to be somewhere around 2.50, almost 3 o'clock at the very edge of their neighborhood, which, you know, would make sense from the time that she may have gotten off the bus yeah. to the time that she was walking to Burger Barn. Mm-hmm. Um, the family um, goes ahead and they confirm that the last text that she had sent was about 2.50 to a guy named Jay. Um, she was asking Jay if he wanted to come over and hang out. He later texts her back and tells her, oh, I can't or no. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, that I was. Um, I want to say that that happened in the uh, disappeared episode as well as on the mom's website. The mom has her own website for uh, Allie, and it stated there that uh, Jay was the last person she had texted asking if they could hang out. Who was Jay? A boyfriend or what? No, uh, Jay was a friend. I guess that they had known for a while. Okay. Um, Joanne says that. They had been fairly close for a couple of years. Allie, at this time, did have a fairly new boyfriend named DJ. Um, They were able to also talk to him the days coming, uh, or the days after um, Allie disappeared. And they were able pretty much to uh, have cops later clear him Mm -hmm. um, because he had also been trying to get a hold of uh, of Allie. those the day of and the day after i believe um you know calling and texting her hey where are you are you okay what's going on Mm -hmm. Uh, please talk to me kind of thing um so aside from also figuring out who she was lost speaking to um the dad noticed john had noticed that there was a shell station right across from where the burger barn was and they were able to get video footage of the day that Allie had went disappearing uh, or had gone disappeared sorry uh and they noticed that that footage actually got um a hold of pretty much like the entire four-way intersection which was really cool so they could see um all the way down cypress wood for a good amount and then treshwig for a a good amount which Mm -hmm. is uh right in the intersection that she would have to cross to get to burger barn yeah um, they kind of scan through as much as they can, and they don't really see anything uh, suspicious. They don't really see Allie in it. Um, so they hold on to that tape for a while, eventually give that tape to police. So after getting footage of the intersection and seeing really nothing interesting or out of the ordinary there Mm -hmm. the family decides to go to the spring isd transportation center that handles all of the buses that go in and out of spring isd um and they were able to get footage of the actual bus that uh ally rode to and from school every single day Mm -hmm. um and they do have footage of her getting on the school bus going to school and getting on the school bus to go home and also getting off the school bus at her designated uh, stop. bus stop. So, you know, th- at that point, they can confirm Allie came home like she was supposed to. So um, it's so not the school's fault. Exactly. Or it's not like she never even got on the school bus. Yeah. Um, so they have proof. My daughter was on the school bus uh, at this sometime in this point. I spoke to my daughter on the phone and she got off the bus um, in the uh, tape. From the school bus, they were able to recognize two boys that they uh, knew of that lived near them as neighbors. And they go on and they um, 
talk to them. And both boys say that they do remember seeing Allie on the school bus. And they do remember seeing her get off at the same bus stop as always. Yeah. But instead of walking in the direction of their house, she walked the opposite direction towards the exit of the neighborhood. So again, that corresponds with... um, Allie telling Joanne, you know, hey, I want to go down to the burger barn, maybe pick up a shift, pick up my paycheck. Mm-hmm. Um, Joanne later goes back home and she kind of takes a look at Allie's room. And, you know, like any other teenager, I remember I liked my room to be a particular way. I liked all of my things to be in a certain spot. And it was very easy for me to see if anything was missing or even for my mom to see if anything was missing from my room. Yeah. Um, And Joanne noted just that there was nothing missing from her room. All of her clothes was still there. Her makeup was still there. Like she didn't pack to go anywhere. Exactly. And even if she decided to just like get up and go, two of the most important things really were still in her room, all of her money and even her phone charger. Mm -hmm. And you don't just get up and go without any money. Yeah. Or your phone charger. Um, and so, you know, she knew at that point, Allie did not get up and go. She would not leave without her makeup. She wouldn't leave without some clothes. She definitely wouldn't leave without her money. Probably couldn't leave without her money. Exactly. Um, so at this point, you know, she feels that she has all of this concrete evidence to show police. My daughter didn't just leave. Mm -hmm. Something happened to her. So she gives uh, all of this information to the uh, police and she still feels like police is not taking her seriously. Uh You know, hey, she'll come back. You're just overreacting, so on and so forth. Um, She then hears through, I think it was like a family friend about the Laura Recovery Center and they kind of are a uh, nonprofit organization, I believe, that uh, helps do ground searches and things like that for uh, missing people. Oh, okay. And so they instantly take action. Like it was even quicker than Joanne thought it would be. So instant. They make mm-hmm. flyers, they distribute it everywhere, billboards, you know, they and they instantly start ground searches. Mm-hmm. And about three weeks of ground searches, um, they got a little bit of immediate attention. Yeah, because that area is heavily like. It's, it's a lot of forest in that area. So, yeah. God forbid, something would have happened to her, and they dumped her in a, in the somewhere. It would probably be in those forests. Mm-hmm. And even um, in 2010, uh, the neighborhood that I currently live in did not exist. Yeah. So, that is a, a very large area to search. Um, you know, it would be different if the neighborhood I live in now existed at that point. It would be... Uh, no, it's just woods now. Yeah. It was, it was just woods. Yeah. So, you know, it, it takes them a long time to try to do some ground searching. And, you know, so they start getting some media attention from local news. And at that point, it's when they decide to move her case to the Harris County Sheriff's Office uh, to the Homicide Division. Oh, Okay. And at this point, you know, they the family kind of starts feeling like, okay, something's finally going to start happening. An investigation is finally going to ha- like happen. Yeah. Um, and of course, like any investigation, you have to go through the family first. So the family is getting uh, interrogated. They have to try to compile their alibis or so on and so forth. They get polygraphed as mm-hmm. well. How long after she went missing does this start happening? Uh, roughly about a month or so. Oh, God. Okay. So, yeah, definitely. This should not have happened this long. Um, So, yeah, the family gets polygraphed. They all get cleared. Mm -hmm. Um, And they all go back to uh, Joanne's home and search Allie's room once again. Uh, Joanne has made it very clear that since Allie disappeared, she has not touched anything in Allie's room. It it is just as it has been since that day. Yeah. Um, So they go through her room. And detectives find a couple of journals that Allie would write in. Um, And in some of these journals, there were a couple of passages that stated, I guess, that at some point she may have wanted to run away. Mm -hmm. Um, Joanne states that, you know, Allie wrote a lot in her journals. She loved journaling. And a lot of times she would write these little fiction stories in them. I wish I was a journaler. 
I know. I always wanted to be one. Um, but, you know, Joanne even stated, I don't know how old these are. I don't know when she wrote them. I don't know if they are true. But Allie is just not that kind of person, mm-hmm. you know? So police pretty much still takes this as her daughter ran away and they mm-hmm. refuse to change her status. She's still considered a runaway at this point. So feeling like the family is getting absolutely nowhere with this. Yeah, obviously. Um, they go ahead and they contract a private investigator. The first private investigator that they have, I do not know what his or her name is, but I know that at this point, it's about two years later, and they contact a private investigator to try to see if they can get a a different perspective, get somewhere else that will tell them where Mm -hmm. their daughter is. So this first private detective, um, he pretty much gets a couple of tips from some people and he does his own investigating and starts to lean towards this guy named Brandon Laverne. And he, at this particular time, had been convicted for murdering two women in Louisiana. Oh, and of course, Louisiana is only a couple of drive of hours away from Houston. Yeah. You know, you can get there quickly. Um, and he also had ties to the spring area. So mm. the private investigator is like, I got it. This is probably what it is. I think we're going to get some answers. Um, and he starts looking more into this Brandon guy. Mm-hmm. So Laverne had family that lived approximately 20 miles from the Loitzers. Um, and the person who initially gave the tip about Laverne, uh, had said that the day of, or the week of, or something like that, when, when Allie disappeared, she had seen a girl standing on the side of the road at that particular intersection on Cypresswood and Treshwig talking to someone in a white truck. And Laverne owned a white truck that Mm -hmm. looks very, very similar to the one seen in the security footage that they retrieved from the Shell gas station. And uh, so, you know, they go on and they start digging. They go ahead and give this information to police and police starts doing more investigating on Laverne. Uh, And they see that Laverne, uh, at the time of this happening in 2012, they they see that he set his truck on fire. What the fuck? Yeah. Set his truck on fire about 50 miles north of Spring. And I had no idea that this even happened. So, yeah, they found like... Well, that's not suspicious. Yeah. They find this, like, purely charred truck, uh, you know, 50 miles north of Spring. So, they go ahead and they, they talk to Laverne and the police file for subpoena to get work records. Mm-hmm. And turns out... At the time of Allie's disappearance, Laverne was working offshore in Louisiana. So he eventually was cleared. Yeah, he had an alibi. Mm -hmm. So then I want to say either that same year or the year after, uh, sources kind of vary. Or maybe I think it was the same year. The family hires another private investigator by the name of Amber Kamak. And she begins her investigation. Now, she thoroughly believes that Allie was probably kidnapped or trafficked. Mm -hmm. And I can see her point of view in it um, because human trafficking in Texas is immense. Yeah, especially Houston. Yeah, so I'm going to read this off of Wikipedia really quick. And it says, human trafficking is particularly relevant to Texas because of its close proximity to the U.S.-Mexican border, one of its most international borders that are crossed in the world. Uh, And its extremely diverse population, especially in Houston, uh, according to the Department of Human and Health Services, of more than 50,000 people annually trafficked from foreign countries into the United States, a quarter of them enter through Texas. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And it's insane. You know, like you think about it's, I, it doesn't seem like a stretch to me. Mm-hmm. We're not only close to Mexico, but we also have in Houston, especially we have two of the largest international airports. Yeah. You can just come and go and no one will see you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I definitely do agree with the way that she's coming towards with her investigation, at least with Allie's uh, disappearance. Um, she thoroughly believes that Allie was um, trafficked or kidnapped. So in about uh, October of 2012, she receives a tip from a woman in Ohio who claims to have recognized Allie from, uh, I want to say it was like a poster that was um, put like at a restaurant or something. Okay. Amber goes and she is at this point going undercover, I think as, uh, I, it depends on the place you're reading this at. Uh, one states that she had uh, gone undercover as a madame, which is a woman who uh, purchases women for trafficking. Mm-hmm. And others say that she went undercover as kind of like a drug dealer. Mm-hmm. Um, but either way, she goes undercover. She goes to Ohio and kind of inconspicuously shows this, the same woman, you know, different pictures of Allie. Like, hey, have you seen her? Do you know who she is? And the girl 100% says, oh, yeah, I know who she is. Mm-hmm. I've seen her. She's super quiet. She's actually part of this, like, brothel um, here in Ohio. But I didn't know, you know that she was like missing from the poster that she had seen. Yeah. She knew she was from Texas and claimed that everyone called her alley cat. Mm -hmm. And, uh, she said that the thing that really got her was that she distinctively remembered a scar on Allie's forehead. So she goes back and, uh, Amber uh, goes back. She goes back to the family and tells them what she finds. Mm -hmm. And she's telling her everything, you know. Oh, yeah. She says that they call her Allie Cat. She has a scar on her forehead. And her and Joanne is, Allie's mom is kind of like starstruck. Mm -hmm. Like, holy cow. One of her nicknames that people would call her was Allie Cat. Mm -hmm. And Allie did have a scar on her forehead from chicken pox. Mm -hmm. So with that, you know, confirming pretty much, Amber goes back to Ohio and, and really wants to hone in on this tip. Mm -hmm. Again, she's still undercover. She's going around trying to like inconspicuously find this brothel or crack house that she's part of. And she runs into this guy who she didn't know was an undercover cop. And she's pretty much talking to this guy and asking him, hey, do you know where I could find so-and-so? I'm trying to look for this girl. Eventually, she finds out that this guy is an undercover cop and says, oh, I know where that is. I can... uh, you know, set something up, we can try to raid it, so on and so forth. She pretty much, you know, goes back to the family. I want to say in like November, she goes back to the family and starts talking about um, putting together a plan where she goes in this time for sure as a madame trying to purchase a girl uh, with the undercover cop and, you know, trying to figure out what exactly they should do so that they don't tip anybody off. Yeah. And especially in situations like this where you're selling girls or it's a crack house, you know, there's going to be a shootout if something goes wrong. Yeah. So trying to keep it as safe as possible. Yeah. So it does take a little bit of a, a minute to have them organize this entire ordeal. But she says she goes back to Ohio and she finds the brothel that uh, the undercover cop says Allie is in. She goes in kind of trying to buy drugs at this point. And she says she walks into the house and she, in another room, sees a girl that looks exactly like Allie, Mm -hmm. like to the T. But she says that she has no access to this girl at this point. She just kind of sees her and can confirm at this point that, oh, okay, I think we're in the right place. I think this is Allie. So finally, in January of 2013, the PI, Amber, uh, goes undercover with a wire and she's in contact with that same undercover cop. And they also get SWAT and police to kind of circulate the house and then later be able to raid the house when she gives the word or the code word. They go ahead, they raid the house, and Allie is nowhere to be found. Okay. Nowhere. Uh, Luckily, they were able to save eight women who were being trafficked, as well as, you know, uh, drug deals and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But when they empty out that entire house, no sign of Allie whatsoever. Uh, they do believe that someone may have tipped them off and could have taken Allie elsewhere, yeah. um, seeing as Allie was av- actually not there. So as of 2020, there are no new leads. 
Nothing has emerged uh, to Allie's case, but it is still being investigated in the Houston Homicide Department. HPD pretty much states that they do not believe that Allie was trafficked. What did they believe happened? She ran away. Are they still on that runaway shit? Yes. So uh, Allie is no longer considered a normal runaway. She is considered an endangered runaway. Oh, thanks. Yeah, which literally makes no difference to a regular runaway. An endangered runaway just means that mm, maybe they left under circ- uh, you know suspicious circumstances. Yeah. But they don't believe that the PI is anywhere close to solving this under believing that Ali was trafficked. Mm-hmm which I think is bonkers, to be honest. I was lucky enough to be able to speak to Allie's mom, Joanne. I was able to speak to her kind of like in in what she's done after Allie's disappearance, what she continues to do and what she hopes happens in all of this. Since Allie's disappearance pretty much has happened, Mm -hmm. um, Joanne advocates largely for missing people. Um, She, from what I asked her, she doesn't believe that what she's done so far is making any kind of drastic change on how they see uh, missing persons cases. She sees that a lot of it is still the same in the sense of not taking a lot of these cases seriously, um, not believing, you know, the parents and friends of these people. Which needs to change because you see it over and over again countless times where the cops, the investigators, they think, oh, it's a runaway or it's a runaway. And these girls end up murdered and and sex trafficking. And like, what are you doing? You see it so many times. But I guess there's also the other side where they see it so many times that girls just run away with their boyfriends, don't tell their moms. And, you know. It's a double-edged sword, but... Yeah, and it it truly sucks, especially when you live in a state and a city that are is known for these things. Yeah. So why not try to take these things seriously? And I think that that needs to change for sure. I think anybody in general who goes missing needs to be taken seriously, but especially children. Yeah, and women, little girls, like... She was a little girl. Yeah, she was 16. She had her whole life ahead of her. And Joanne even states, you know, she was making plans for the future. She Mm -hmm. was so excited to plan her birthday party, uh, you know, later that week. And she was so excited to attend, you know, so many events and go fishing with her dad. And it doesn't sound like a little girl that was trying to run away. Exactly. Exactly. And... She, Joanne does say that she does get so many just negative, nasty emails and I'm just sure. phone calls and messages on Facebook of people saying, oh, she probably just loved with her boyfriend. Mm-hmm. But as far as I'm aware, the boyfriend she had was fairly new mm-hmm. and he seemed genuinely concerned as far as we're aware about her disappearing and It doesn't make any sense to me. Alongside that, Joanne has gotten so many people trying to extortion her for money, you know, claiming that they have Allie or they have information about Allie and give us so and so much money and we'll give you answers, but don't get police involved. Don't get this involved. Oh, of course. Yeah. Um, She did say that once she had gone to, I think it was like a cafe here in spring where they had a poster of alley and there was someone who stuck like a little note on that poster and it said the just the nastiest thing it just was like you know let it go let her go she's probably with her boyfriend she ran away she doesn't want to be found she's probably in heaven just pray Uh, like there's no words for that like why why would you take the time out of your day to put something so negative and hurtful and just ridiculous on a missing poster. Like, imagine being the parents to this child 
Like, how would you feel if somebody hit you with that crap? Like, no, it's ridiculous. Exactly. And I obviously don't know what it's like to... People are sick. You know, feel the way that she feels, but it's not something that you tell anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, you just don't tell people, oh, I think your daughter is probably dead. You should just pray for peace. Mm. No. But, you know, uh, she says aside from that, she does believe that social media is bringing a new light to the way that people give attention to missing people. She says that since Ali's disappearance in 2010, we didn't have the same kind of social media um, advantages as we do now um, to be able to share a post to the immenseness that we can now. And she does see that, you know, nowadays people... It might not be from local media, but at least on social media, we can get the attention that we want to be able to find our family members. Yeah. Um, So she does say that social media in that sense is helpful um, to be able to spread the word from people all over the country or all over the world. Yeah, somebody could have saw her at like Walmart in like Montana and, you know, and then they saw the post on Facebook, you know, a few days later or something and it just, you know could help yeah um and then i did ask joanne what she thought about the trafficking um view of Mm -hmm. ali's case Uh, she does believe that ali could have been kidnapped or trafficked she said quote as much as you think that your child would do the right thing all of the time that's just not the realistic thing to think about Mm -hmm. uh and i do think that what she said is true i think uh as any parent i mean i'm not a parent you're not a parent but We can only assume that our parents thought that Mm -hmm. we knew right from wrong. And sometimes, you know, when you're a teenager and you're 16 and you're 17, you just think you're at the top of the world Mm -hmm. and you think nothing can touch you. And you have to kind of think of that. You could have raised your kid as much as the greatness that you you thought you did, but mm, you never know what could have happened. Mm Mm-hmm. She does say Allie was the kind of girl that wanted to please everyone and make everyone like her. So in that sense, she does think that something could have happened. She could have trusted the wrong person. And I 100% believe that at that age, you are so easily manipulated and you're very gullible. And you assume you assume that the world isn't out to hurt you when it really is. Mm-hmm. And I feel like at that age, it's like, no, why Why would they kidnap me? Or why would they do that? Or, you know, you have such an innocent, like, mindset. Mm-hmm. And it's just, you know, it isn't, it yeah. isn't what it is. And, and especially it happening so close to home, you know, anything could happen. Uh, you know, she could have just been walking the street. Someone could have pulled up behind her or side of her and asked, hey, do you know where so-and-so is? Mm-hmm. And, you know, Allie, being the nice girl that she is, you know, could have been, oh, yeah, you just go to take a left here and boom, something could have happened. Or in the case that, like, um, the girls in Chicago, the three girls. Yes, yes, with Ariel Castro. Yeah, Ariel Castro. Like, with Ariel Castro, he was friends. Like, he, he was the little girl's, like, the father of the little girl's friends. So... Mm-hmm. They don't think anything of it. Like, oh, that's so-and-so's dad. You know, he's harmless. Or he's he's the school bus driver. He's harmless. Or, he, yeah. you know, he works here. He's harmless. And she could have easily been like, oh, hey, so-and-so's dad. Or, hey, the guy that works at Burger Barn with me. Or, hey, the guy that works next door to Burger Barn. It's always nice to me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you don't know. He could have just snatched her up. Or he could have been like, hey, get in my car. I'll give you a ride. Yeah, and I think that you have to think of all the possibilities when it comes to a situation like that. (laughs) And it's, I don't really know where the investigation is at now. It is ongoing, so I don't believe uh, they would say anything to anybody. But yeah, I mean, it could be anybody. It could be someone she knew. It could be someone she didn't know. Oh yeah, they could have held a gun to her and were like, get in the the freaking car, like, mm -hmm. now. And, you know... Yeah, one hundred percent. Aside from social media, uh, obviously Joanne sees from talking to other mothers and other family members of missing people that you know local media gets bored with missing people. They they cover it for a day or two and then they don't see anything else exciting about it. So 
they ignore it. Mm -hmm. And because of that, she does advocate so much. And she even does events and she does proclamations, not just for her own daughter. In the, like, media. Yeah, and obviously not just for her her own daughter, but other people as well. She knows and she's in this place. She understands what it feels like. She does currently run a Facebook group called Moms of the Missing, uh, which actually became the title of a book that was released in October of 2019, which features Allie's case. You know, and Joanne says that she's lucky enough to have and thankful enough to to have started this Facebook page. She says mm-hmm. that she has more than a hundred members from around the world. Uh, it is a private page, so she will only accept people who uh, do have missing children. And she says that she does this page because she feels that when she does speak publicly about her feelings towards Allie. And the way that she feels with the way that people talk about Allie's case, she feels very much judged. So she is surrounding herself with people that completely and wholly understand what she's going through. Exactly. So that way, you know, she states that she can speak her mind and Mm -hmm. she doesn't have to worry about what other people are saying about her. Yeah. She also does run a public Facebook page for Allie called um, Hope for Allie. In this Facebook page, not only is she speaking about Allie and, you know, talking about the events that will be happening uh, in Houston to advocate for Allie, but she also shares other missing people's posts. Um, and she updates people on what their investigations are like, if they are found and so on and so forth. So mm-hmm. she does dedicate a lot of time to being the person who who advocates for these people yeah and we'll definitely link to that in our description because i feel like that's very important 100 percent access to yeah her hard work has definitely paid off this year actually council members proclaimed february 3rd 2020 as missing persons day in houston and obviously this is to bring awareness to the thousands of adults and children that go missing in houston and i think that that is absolutely amazing yeah that she had hand in that Mm -hmm. absolutely amazing i think that she so hard to be able to get this recognition because it's not just about her daughter but it's about everyone not only in houston but in texas and in the entire world Mm -hmm. and i think people need to start taking these things very seriously 100 um these are people's family members these are people's daughters and mothers and fathers and uncles and aunts and sisters and i think you know people really really need to to take this seriously i do want to end this episode with uh the information that is on Allie's missing uh persons poster okay alexandria ali joy lowitzer was last seen april 26 2010 at around 3 p.m near low ridge drive and trushwig road in spring texas she was wearing a black hoodie white shirt and black and white checkered pants with black shoes She had a blue slider style cell phone and a black rimmed glasses. She was also wearing a checkerboard, uh, like a checker styled multicolored backpack. She was wearing braces with pink bands at the time. Allie's hair color is brown, eyes are blue, and she is Caucasian, weighing approximately 145 pounds at the time of her disappearance, and uh, her height is about five feet two inches. If you have any information regarding the disappearance of Allie Lowitzer, please contact the Harris County Sheriff's uh, Office at 713-967-5810, or you can also contact Texas EquiSearch at 281-309-9500. Thanks for listening. If you'd like more content like you just heard, add us on patreon.com forward slash true crime dropouts. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram at true crime dropouts. And don't forget, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, and more. If we aren't on your favorite streaming service, let us know and we will see what we can do. Stay in school.